Ninja CPA Review presents the Assassin audio series for auditing and attestation. Narrated by Jeff Elliott, CPA. Copyright 2012, Ninja CPA Review, LLC. Chapter 6, Audit Sampling. Audit sampling is simply taking part of a population, subjecting it to audit procedures, and projecting those results to the population. This is important because the auditor simply cannot audit every single transaction. For example, let's say you have 100 gumballs and you test the quality of 10 of them and make an inference about the entire bag of 100 gumballs based on the 10 that you sampled. That's that's audit sampling. First, we will discuss statistical versus non-statistical sampling. Statistical sampling is based on formulas and helps the auditor to find an appropriate audit sample. Statistical sampling also helps evaluate the evidence obtained and to quantify sampling risk, which we will talk more about in just a minute. So, statistical sampling is based on formulas, whereas non-statistical sampling is based on human decision. If you get a question on the exam asking you which type of sampling is preferred, the answer is both. Both are equally acceptable. We've covered substantive procedures, also known as substantive testing. What type of sampling do substantive procedures use? Substantive procedures use variable sampling and probability proportionate to size sampling. Let's dig into each of these. Variable sampling is testing for a dollar amount. The value in the sample gives information about the value in the entire population as expressed in mean, or average, per unit. Mean per unit is the sample average for whatever you're testing. Again, this is a dollar amount times the number in the population. Stratification is a form of variable sampling where similar transactions are grouped together. For instance, all transactions greater than $1 million are grouped together and then subjected to audit procedures. Stratification decreases the effect of variance in the population and it reduces sample size. Probability proportionate to size sampling is a form of variable sampling. One thing to know about probability proportionate to size sampling, and know this for for the exam for a quick point, it does not use standard deviation. Like regular variable sampling, the auditor focuses on a dollar amount. With probability proportionate to size sampling, larger or more valuable items get picked more often as part of the sample and any projected misstatements, which are misstatements that are found in the sample, then the auditor has to take them and project them to the remainder of the audit population. So what's the difference between variable sampling and probability proportionate to size sampling? Well, for purposes of the CPA exam, variable sampling makes it easy to expand the sample size. And selecting zero and negative balances is also easier. Probability proportionate to size sampling is easier to design and use than classic variable sampling because it results in a smaller sample size to audit and it's stratified and homogeneous in nature. That covers sampling as it relates to substantive procedures. Now we turn to control tests, which uses Attribute sampling. Attribute sampling looks at control procedures and asks questions like, were invoices approved before they were paid? Unlike variable sampling, errors are stated in terms of percentages with attribute sampling, not dollar amounts. For instance, five invoices out of 100 were not approved before they were paid. 5 out of 100, the error rate is 5%. It's important to note 
that if you see error rate on the CPA exam, they are referring to attribute sampling. And it's a giveaway that they are asking a question about controls. Control procedures are either operating properly or they are not operating properly based on the error rate and the toleration for errors that the auditor has. The tolerable rate is the error rate in the population that you are willing to accept. The tolerable rate has an inverse relationship to sample size. A higher tolerable rate means a smaller sample size. The auditor will accept a higher error rate, so they will audit a smaller sample size. A lower tolerable rate for errors means a larger sample size. The auditor will accept a lower error rate, so they, were, they will audit a larger sample size. If the auditor is willing to accept a higher probability that errors, errors exist, then there is less pressure on the sample being audited. The error rate has a direct relationship to the sample size. More errors expected, larger sample. Less errors expected, smaller sample. This all makes sense. If you expect more errors, you do more work. It's called attribute sampling because the attribute in the sample gives information about the entire audit population and is used to estimate the internal control error rate. The expected population deviation rate, deviation means error, is used to determine the initial level of control risk. I'll say that again. The expected population deviation rate is used to determine the initial level of control risk. Just to recap, what is control risk again? Control risk is one of the components of audit risk joining inherent risk and detection risk. And that is the risk that internal controls will fail to prevent a material misstatement. The allowable risk of over-reliance is the risk of assessing control risk too low. The allowable, control, the allowable risk of over-reliance gives you sampling risk. What is sampling risk? Again, we will get to that in just a moment. It's important to note that the attribute sampling is only useful when there is an audit trail to test. Auditors use attribute sampling when the existence of an error needs to be verified or debunked. Finally, sampling risk. Sampling risk is the risk that your sample isn't representative of the population. This can happen even if the audit is done properly. For example, you sample 10 gumballs out of 100 and conclude that the bag of gumballs is acceptable for sale to your customers when in fact the other 90 that were in the bag, they are inedible. That is sampling risk. Two important topics within sampling risk that you need to be familiar with on exam day are the risk of assessing control risk too high and the risk of assessing control risk too low. The risk of assessing control risk too high is a risk of control testing where the sample overstates control risk, which means that the auditor has to do more substantive testing because they cannot rely on the controls. Since control risk is assessed to be too high, this leads to an under-reliance on internal controls, an over-testing of evidence, and overall audit inefficiency. The audit ends up being effective and leads to the correct result, but the auditor does more work than was necessary. That covers the risk of assessing control risk too high. We will now turn to the risk of assessing control risk too low. The risk of assessing control risk too low 
is again a risk of control testing where the sample understates control risk. Basically, it tells the auditor that the controls are stronger than they truly are. This error leads to an over-reliance on internal control, under-testing of evidence, and overall audit ineffectiveness. The risk of assessing control risk too low has an inverse relationship to sample size. If there is a higher accepted risk of assessing control risk too low, then the auditor will choose a smaller sample. If there is a lower accepted risk of assessing control risk too low, then the auditor will choose to audit a larger sample size. Assessing control risk too low also leads to a higher detection risk. Why? Let's recap. Detection risk is the risk that the auditor will fail to detect a material misstatement. How does the auditor lower detection risk? By doing more testing. In this instance, control risk has been assessed to be lower than it actually is, so the auditor feels they, that they can rely more on controls than they really should, which causes them to do fewer substandard procedures, which again leads to a higher detection risk. Some of these relationships can be confusing, but if you think about it, it makes sense. If controls are good, the auditor does less testing for the sake of audit efficiency. When an auditor does less testing, then detection risk goes up. If controls are bad, the auditor does more testing and detection risk goes down. Remember, detection risk is the one variable that the auditor can control because it's dependent on how much work they do. Now, if control risk is assessed too low, it does not necessarily mean that the financial statements are materially misstated. However, it does mean that there, if there is a material misstatement, the auditor is less likely to find it. Incorrect acceptance. Incorrect acceptance is a risk of substantive testing. So we were talking about control testing, now we're moving back to substantive testing. Incorrect acceptance is the risk that the auditor will accept a balance as fairly stated when in fact it's not fairly stated. This hurts audit effectiveness because the wrong conclusion is reached. The audit may be efficient, but it's not effective. You would much rather have an inefficient audit than an ineffective audit, by the way. Investors don't care if it took the auditor more time than it should have to do the audit. Investors do care, however, if the auditor misses something and their investments are based on financial information that contains material misstatements. Incorrect rejection. Incorrect rejection is also a risk of substantive testing. With incorrect rejection, the auditor rejects a balance as fairly stated when in fact it is fairly stated. This hurts audit efficiency because they end up doing more work, but it doesn't hurt its effectiveness. Non-sampling risk. While sampling risk is the risk that your sample isn't representative of the population, non-sampling risk is the risk of the auditor missing an error. Synonyms for non-sampling risk to be aware of on exam day are exception, error, and deviation. Sampling versus non-sampling risk. What's the basic difference? Sampling risk deals with the chance that your audit sample is flawed. Non-sampling risk deals with the chance that your human decisions or the conclusions that you reach are flawed. What are some factors that affect sample size? Tolerable rate for error, which has an inverse relationship with sample size, more error tolerance, smaller sample.
risk of assessing control risk too low, which has an inverse relationship with sample size. If there is a high risk that control risk will be assessed to be lower than it should be, the auditor will end up with a smaller sample. Expected population error rate has a direct relationship with sample size. Higher expected errors, bigger sample. Fewer expected errors, smaller sample. Let's cover the formula for audit sampling. The formula is sample error rate plus allowance for sampling risk must be less than the tolerable error rate. Let's say that the sample error rate is 5%. The auditor audited a sample of 100 invoices and 5 out of those 100 were not approved correctly. So the sample error rate again is 5%. The allowance for sampling risk is the amount that you add to the sample error rate to get some cushion for your sample. Now this amount is based on auditor experience. If the auditor sets the allowance for sampling risk at 2%, well, then that means that the population error rate could reach 7%. Again, the sample error rate was 5%, plus the allowance for sampling risk, which the auditor assessed to be at 2% based on their judgment. So those two numbers combined bring the population error rate to 7%. And that must be less than the tolerable error rate. The tolerable error rate is the population error rate that the auditor is willing to accept. If the population error rate is less than the tolerable error rate, then the auditor accepts the control as effective. So in this case, the population error rate was 7%. If that's less than the error rate that they are willing to tolerate, then accept the control risk as effective. If the population error rate is greater than the tolerable error rate, so in this case, the population error rate was 7%, but the tolerable error rate maybe was 5%, well, then the auditor has to do more testing to get the sample error rate lower, or that they, have, they have to conclude that the control isn't effective. In this case, maybe the auditor audits another 100 invoices and finds that all of those 100 invoices were properly approved. This means that instead of 5 out of 100 had errors, now 5 out of 200 had errors. So previously, the sample error rate was 5%. Now it's 5 out of 200, so now it's down to 2.5%. And we said that the tolerable error rate maybe it was 5%, well, 2.5% plus the 2% brings us to 4.5%, less than the 5% tolerable error rate. Moving on to sampling plans. Sampling plans determine the substantive test objective. So, what is our objective? In this example, our objective is to determine whether sales shipments have been billed. So that's our objective. Second, we define the population, which in this case are shipping documents. And we take a sample of those shipping docu documents. And our sample size that we choose is based on our tolerable error rate, the risk of assessing control risk too low, and the expected population error rate. Next, we perform the sampling plan. We take those shipping documents and trace them forward to see if they were billed. Finally, we evaluate and document our results. To close out this chapter, let's cover four types of sampling. Systematic sampling. 
This is where the auditor takes the population and every certain number is selected using the shipping documents example. If there were 1,000 documents and our sample size was supposed to be 100, well, the auditor might select every 10th document. In order for this to work, the population of shipping documents needs to be randomly ordered, however. A primary advantage of systematic sampling is that the population doesn't require pre-numbering. There's your exam tip right there. For systematic sampling, a primary advantage is that the population doesn't require pre-numbering. Next is sequential sampling, which is also called stop or go sampling. With sequential sampling, each audit step determines the next step. They go in order. Discovery sampling. With discovery sampling, the audit is testing an area that is so crucial that zero population errors can be tolerated. For instance, are there any phony employees on the payroll? That's important to know. Finally is block sampling. Block sampling is easy to implement, but it's the worst method of sampling. If you get a question on the exam about the least effective method of sampling, it's block sampling. An example of block sampling would be the auditor picking all shipping documents from the month of June and then projecting those results to the other 11 months. This concludes Chapter 6.